Hello and welcome to another Diplomat podcast. I'm Luke Hunt and with me is Michael Parra, a former cleric with the Catholic Church who is now a great-grandfather and an advocate for victims of child sex abuse. I'd just like to add, this podcast was recorded before the High Court of Australia overturned a conviction for child sex abuse by Cardinal George Pell, a senior advisor to the Pope. Michael Parra is also an academic who has played an important role in rebuilding Cambodia's higher education in the aftermath of a 30-year war and has a long family history in the region dating back to the 1930s. I began by asking Michael about the great changes he has witnessed in Southeast Asia. Well, if we have Southeast Asia extending from Papua New Guinea through Indonesia all the way up the peninsula to Vietnam, Cambodia, where do you finish? Korea. Uh, right. Uh, if, if you look at that, what are the great changes? Well, when I first went to Papua New Guinea and to Indonesia, for that sake, for example, I mean, the women in the villages and so on were topless. You know, there was a, I suppose we would say there was an innocence. There was a, an openness. Uh, it wasn't like that to them. They took it for granted. But in, in the, and, and I'm talking about the 50s and 60s, I mean, their economy was continuing on from generations. I mean, the changes in Southeast Asia... Uh, Papua New Guinea is one thing, but when you get to Indonesia, each of them are so uniquely different. But the the burden on the people, uh, so many of them gone through revolutions, the Sukarno period, and now suddenly they find themselves in a modern age, a modern age in which cars choke up the streets, in which... Uh, people are trying to follow the Western ways, particularly with the universities. You've got the whole economy. Uh, now you've got every country wanting its own uh, monetary system. And why not? Because it's a great source of income. I mean, the difference between 50s and 60s and this 21st century are just inconceivable uh, to someone looking back there. Of those countries, which ones stand out the most? Which ones were your favourites? Oh, well, that, that's... that's uh, Entirely subjective, but <laughs> any, nevertheless. Uh, well, because I've spent 20 years now on 43 assignments backwards and forwards to Cambodia, that's unique. I suppose before that, it would have been Papua New Guinea, where the pair of family had roots going back to the 1930s and the Edie Creek and Wow and the Gold Rush days and Ray Pera and uh, Kevin and others starting up the um, New Guinea Flying Service, flying in the German machinery to the Wow and Bolono gold mines. Mm -hmm. And they really pioneered air services in Papua New Guinea. So for me, uh, Papua New Guinea's always had a very special place and I went there in 1953 because several of my uncles had, after the war, where they were members of the um, New Guinea Special Force, and then Damien, an uncle, you know, involved with uh, uh, Kokoda Frontline and Salt on Salamoa and um, Men of Timor. I mean, in those days, before television and newspapers, the, the owlies, the owlies as we call them, you'd go into a main city and they'd have theatres which would have a loop. So they would have a program that would be repeated every 60 minutes. Now, during the war, Damien's short films, I mean, normally a journalist or a photographer would come back and would have, you know, 10, 15, 30, 60 seconds on the news. Damien got to the stage where he would have 6, 8, 12 minutes, right. mini documentaries. And so he became, I suppose today we'd say it almost a cult figure, because he had a style of photographing that brought the audience right to the front line. Mm -hmm. And he was seeking to show war through the expression on the diggers' faces. I mean, it's quite a, a, a revolutionary, uh, now it's quite common, but you shoot the war not with planes dropping wombs, but by focusing on the men's faces in the front line. Right. 
So Papua New Guinea was always very special. I suppose as a young priest, Indonesia became important because it was a very close country and the focus of missionary effort people and priests and so on going up there to save the poor souls and we learned of the liturgical revival the avant-garde movements within the church particularly at the center in Jogjakarta and so Indonesia was important and in, in just before that I mean in my last days as a priest I was sent to Vietnam as a chaplain uh, to the Australian advisory force under mm. Colonel Ted Sarong up at Bamatuk we went up to Dalat, Nha Trang, uh, da, da Nang, and then up to Hue so I was an experienced the devastation of the Viet Cong but at that stage, I saw here you had a revolutionary group who were fighting for independence for themselves. I mean, it took me a long time to come around and realise that they were the good guys. They were, they were fighting for legitimate independence of their own culture and force. And uh, so that's when I came to realise that Norodom Sihanouk, in rejecting the US forces in opening up the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia it led to devastation right up to the Phnom Penh right. the bombing uh, he took a lot of suffering for that and so and and uh, I was in a village uh, out of um, Bamitook when we were attacked by the Akong at night and so we went under the church into all these little hovels and things came out the next day and you had all these things scattered, you know, to the people, read me, join the Liberation Army. And that's when I said, Mike, you've got to get out of the church. Got out of the church. And um, so I applied for a job in the ABC. I didn't realise I was one of 200 applied for it. Anyway, I got it. And uh, the rest is history. Um, And then I went to the Archbishop and said, you know, I want to get out of this. I want a dispensation from all my clerical vows of celibacy, of saying the divine office, da-da-da-da-da. And it came back. He said, I've got the rescript from Rome. You're free to go. If you ever get married, it must be in secret and private. You must never return to parishes which you've worked. And I said, come on, I can't sign a thing like that. Right. Send it back. He said, I'll send it back. They'll never agree to it. And I said, I don't care, send it back. Anyway, nine months later, I came back and I got out and and I was doing a program for the ABC on GROW, self-help groups for mentally sick people based mm-hmm. on Alcoholics Anonymous. So I went along to the Sydney Hospital one night to do a program and there was... Uh, uh, this woman running the show about 40 people out of jail, alcoholics, mentally sick. Now. And after afterwards, um, they all went off for coffee and she stayed to put the chairs away. I remember I went up to her and I said, well, that was a performance, Little Miss God. So we got chatting. We both liked James Bond. I took her out to a movie that week and the rest is history. And you were married and... Married, got married uh, sometime later, four kids, 12, 12 grandkids, seven great grandkids. Best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. But I've got to say, looking back on the last uh, 86 years, I mean, the one that I, by quite happen chance, have become involved in is Cambodia. And yes, I've got a, a foolish uh, love affair with the people great admiration for them, don't understand their culture, but have uh, taken that on board and have become part of it. Well, Cambodia has recently commemorated 20 years of peace. Uh, you were there right at the tail end of the end of a 30-year war, which encompassed uh, Lon Nol, the Khmer Rouge, uh, Vietnamese occupation, and the country was, uh, well, it was a failed state. How do you think it has improved over the last 20 years and the country is still riddled with many problems? Well, that's true. I mean, I arrived in November 2001. I I just finished at Melbourne University and uh, I volunteered to work with the IVF program, the Indigenous Volunteer Foundation, working among the Australian Aborigines. And I got this call out of the blue from the director of 
uh, Australian business volunteers. Now, both of those were part of AusAid, and they said to me, look, we're looking for someone uh, for academic professional development among the lecturers at Norton University, and you seem to fit the bill. And she, who was uh, on the board of the IVF and director of Australian business volunteers, said, do you mind if I ring him? So she rang me and said look, there's this position and they're looking for someone, you know, in three or four weeks' time to go to Cambodia. Uh, Would you be available? I said, sure, sure. I rocked up in November 2001, and so I was there for a month or so giving lectures uh, to academics. So they had scheduled for me six days each week, starting at 7 o'clock, lecturing till 12, 12 o'clock, and then back at 2 o'clock till 5 o'clock. Right. Uh, I said, this is impossible, you know, you don't do it that way. Anyway, we went ahead with them. At that stage, the only form of pedagogy that higher education knew was face-to-face teaching with a teacher right. or lecturer in front. And a lot of people were learning by rote as well. It was kind yeah. of... Uh, but it was uh, very unique. I mean, uh, getting to know and work with, I suppose there were about 200 academic lecturers at Norton at that stage. Right. Now, any lecturing to 200, you know, is on a short course to nothing. You know, it just can't be done. You know. I suppose things developed from there. This was just after UNTAC. Mm-hmm. So, and this was just after, I think, Hun Sen had become Prime Minister for about three or four years or so. Right. And it was uh, number two. There were two Prime Ministers. That's right, in the early 1990s or mid-1990s and then Hun Sen really after the elections in 1998 again. Certainly by 2001, Hun Sen was in control. I arrived at a time when the whole community and certainly the universities were drawing its breath. Now, Norton was the first private university set up in the country in 1996. Mm -hmm. And I think at that stage, the student number was pushing up towards the 8, 9, 10,000. There was enormous demand back then, as it still is now, but uh, it, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it was a failed state and there was a lot of work to be done in terms of rehabilitating Cambodia. How successful has uh, the rehabilitation been, notwithstanding uh, the kind of recent return of authoritarianism? It's very hard for me to answer that. I mean, one of the areas that I've come involved in is engineering and architecture. In fact, our DCD, our Developing Cambodia by Degrees, which is a learning centre based on open e-learning methods. So when I look to say, how do you judge success? I mean, I follow the views of His Excellency Van Mollivan, who died, what, three years ago? The famous architect. Yeah. Oh, not just the famous architect. I mean, he was the first graduate in architecture from uh, of all of Cambodia, from the uh, Sorbonne University in Paris. Uh, he went over there on a law student scholarship. Within 12 months, he switched to architecture. He uh, graduated, and then he came back, and um, Sihanouk, who was in charge to start with, made him director of public works. Right. And, uh, and very important, in establishing major buildings, you've got the Olympic Stadium, you've got the Chattanooga Centre, you've got the villages of people, you've got the uh, centre of the RUPP, you've got some most spectacular buildings built on what Van Mollivan would say is the architectural principles of the Khmer great builders from Angle Wat. I mean, he constantly deplored the use of air conditioning. He right. said, what we should be doing is having open spaces. The breeze has come through. And so there is a style of architecture. I mean, the great Angle builders of Jai Forum and so on, I mean, they were essentially hydrographers mm-hmm. in the use of water, both as waterways, as moats, as not only uh, for garden and irrigation. So there is a whole culture 
of Khmer architecture that then Molly Vans thought was vanishing. So when you ask me about changes and what's happening now, I go back there and I look around. I look around the Olympic Stadium and what do I see? One, two, three, four, six high-rise apartments all in concrete and glass. Nothing to do with the architectural style suited to the country. And shooting up by the month, building after well, building. You know, the number of cranes stop dotting the um, skyscape mm-hmm. in Phnom Penh. And, um, you know, d- uh, down at uh, Kep, you had that collapse. Of That's right. There was a recent building collapse, uh, 36, 38 people killed. Killed, yeah, yeah. And that's what's going to happen. One of the endeavours of the Hun Sen government is that to bring in quality controls, quality controls mm-hmm. in education, universities right. and in building. And uh, so I said to them, look, let's start a professional development course mm-hmm. for the elite, the elite graduates from universities in engineering and architecture who are interested in focusing on the rebirth and of traditional Khmer engineering and architecture. Right. So that's when we started DCD, Developing Cambodia by Degrees. And that's a double entendre, you know, we go step by step, but also it's by university qualifications and degree. Uh, and so DCD was born. And, you know, this time I went back, we graduate, we graduate three to four hundred a year. And that's been going on really since 2007. Now, that's 12 years. Now, it's a small thing, you know, three, four, five thousand students. But I'm very proud of their work, of what they do. But to, to implement that takes a lot of hard work and a lot of principles. And, cu- and cultural shifts, I would imagine. I think the Khmer people have a natural appetite for quality, to do things well. They look back on their history and say, you know, the giant Boromans did things spectacularly. It stood the test of centuries. So I think that when you talk about quality to Khmer people, they say, yes, we want that. We'll go with it. We'll Mm -hmm. do anything to achieve it. The next major step forward in Cambodia is PhD by research, where you get uh, quality individuals who can negotiate with NGOs, with companies, with engineering firms, government departments, and say, what is the area of great need that you have? We can give you a PhD student full-time for three years to research the area that you want to do. And it'll cost you $2,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, very hard to get going. Right. Because they are committed, uh, and it's not just um, Cambodia and Southeast Asia, I mean, it's Africa, and Zimbabwe, where I was involved for 10 years in the 90s, setting up the Open University. Uh, they, these countries, they love to see smiling faces in classrooms and they love to have teachers who can keep them under control of course that's useless these days right now on another note as a former cleric from australia uh you were heavily deeply involved with uh supporting uh victims of pedophiles within the catholic church which resulted in the royal commission and the subsequent jailing of uh George Pell, Cardinal Pell, number two in the Vatican. When you look back, and it's still recent history, when you look back where it all started and how it ended up, how does that leave you oh, appalling, now? Appalling, appalling, devastating. You see, I, I, I went uh, into the seminary in 1952. I was there for eight years. Uh, apart from a couple of incidents... We were pretty oblivious to sexual abuse. I mean, the one thing we look back on in our seminary training is how sex was totally ignored. I mean, here they were training guys who were going to be celibate for the rest of their life, and they don't even mention, you know, the drive, the power, the uh, urgency of continuing the human race through sex. I mean, it's denial, denial, denial. So when the pedophile scandal broke, 
and I suppose it really didn't break until the early 90s. Uh, now, as I look back, uh, of the 278 guys that uh, were ordained when I was in the seminary, 21 of them, 7%, 21 of them <coughs> have been convicted of pedophilia uh, and committed and, and convicted in court of law or have had compensation paid against them or have fled the country or died awaiting sentence. 21 of guys that I knew. Uh, two of them were in my year. One of them was um, a terrible sex maniac almost. You know, the trail of destruction he left behind, not just with kids, but with women. Uh, so in, all of that came as a terrible shock. And uh, as you know, with uh, your nephew, I'm involved in a group of guys who were at the seminary. We meet each month and have done so for 30 year, years. All of us are shocked. We certainly welcome the Royal Commission, but like the rest of the Catholic and the wider community, we were blown off our feet by the appalling stories that emerged. And it wasn't just that these graduates as priests who were pushed through eight years of training without proper and adequate preparation, but the thing that knocked the hell out of us was the way bishops continued to cover up, the church continued to cover up. I mean, Dennis Hart in the Victorian Parliamentary Committee of uh, Inquiry, he admitted at that stage that the Catholic Archdiocese had spent $18 million defending priests in court. And they, had spe and they had spent $18 million in giving compensation to victims, mm -hmm. which really tells you that the church that defending our own is, is as important as helping the victims. Right. And even now, even now, I mean, you've got Bird up in Ballarat who's fighting, you know, for one of his pedophile priests against... He lost the court case and cost him a million dollars. There's one in Melbourne that cost him two to three million dollars. But they continue to carry on in a sense of denial. I mean, this is what has devastated the Catholics of Melbourne and the world. And why the when I grew up in St James Garden Vale, we'd have over two thousand people at mass every Sunday. Now, when I go back to '78, lucky to get to a hundred. Less than 10% of census Catholics participate in religious activities today. Right. And so the church is defending. The people have walked away, walked away. I mean, not one of my brothers or their children go near a church. Mm -hmm. It's a dirty word. You know, Catholicism equals pedophilia equals George Pell. Right. Rightly or wrongly, that's the perception. And you've got to say that ordinary Australians who are more interested in footy and cricket than, than Jesus, uh, they are no fools. I mean, you don't pull the wool over the majority of Australians. They see through the church and they say, to hell with it, you know. Mm -hmm. The extraordinary thing is that the church is so powerful and rich. Uh, at the moment, I mean, they get huge sums, huge sums of money through the education system, uh, huge sums of money through the uh, hospital and medical system and in the social welfare system. And right. George was very successful at that. Uh, I remember saying to mm -hmm. Eric Hodgins, a uh, mate of mine, a priest still, uh, uh, I said, Eric, you know, I, I don't get George. And Eric said, "Why? Oh, come on, it's simple. He just doesn't have the faith. He just doesn't have the faith. <laughs> well, so be it. Oh, at, least, at least there was a stop put to it, and I understand that in America now there are class action suits being launched against the Boy Scout uh, Association, and that's looking to become, uh, people are talking that as uh, this will be the next step in terms of pedophilia and the molestation of boys really across the Western world. 
uh, you see, I see priests and the church as different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Boy Scouts don't go out and say, you know, here we've got dedicated people and they've given their whole lives to God and they're not going to get married and they right. won't. You don't have that with Boy Scouts. So I think that the church is in a different category. Right. And why, uh, I mean, I'm still chair of what we call For the Innocents. It's a group of only 56 of us, but we are committed to advocacy for the victims and healing of victims. It's our only focus, and we stick to that. And we look at positive things. We're trying to set up gardens of healing in uh, hotbeds of pedophilia around parishes and in dioceses. Um, we're developing a theology of the child because we see in training the child as a special individual was neglected and this has led to priests abusing children um, we've got a strategy for uh, uh, restoring the face of jesus in parishes so we try to be very positive and not to be negative and to work with um, you know those uh, good guys still in the church right and on that note at 86, what's next? Oh, a lot, a lot, a lot. When I was at Bhubanaswa in uh, eastern India with um, Community Aid Abroad, I went to a guru and he read my palm and he said, see your lines there, you will live to be 99. So I've got 13 years to go. Some way to go. A lot to do. On that note, Michael Parra, thank you very much. Thanks, Luke.